This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 307 of the program. Today is Friday, September 24th, and before we get started, as we usually do, I want to take some time to thank all of the folks who make this show possible, all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, and that includes Becca Link, Christopher Ware, Emily A, Enlighten Me 11, From Cradle to a Casket, Galen Thurber, Isaac Sadaka, Karen Sheets, Kenny Not Blankenship, Kyrion Printup, Maggie Temple, Mary Dorley, Papa Doc, and Stop Resisting. Thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. We've got a great show for you today. Lots of different topics to talk about, but certainly something for everyone, hopefully. So we'll talk about mainstream media and how they're still pretending that the parliamentarians' recommendations matter at all. I will explain to you why they don't. U.S. Border Patrol agents were seen whipping Haitian migrants in a Texas border town. We'll talk about that. Also, a George W. Bush speech was interrupted not once, but twice in a week. Tulsi Gabbard gives up her fake anti-war shtick and goes full imperialist, confirming what many of us on the left have been saying about her for a very long time, that she's a total fucking fraud. Tucker Carlson's anti-vaccine disinformation actually got someone killed. A Breitbart writer blames liberals for making conservatives anti-vax by using reverse psychology. Also, a Florida GOP bookkeeper who's anti-mask and anti-vax dies of COVID-19 and locks his own party out of their finance software. Marjorie Greene releases a new political ad that breaks the cringe meter, and a new report finds that ending the pandemic-related unemployment benefits didn't actually contribute to job growth. Shocker. And Joe Biden's administration caves to Republicans and allows drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. That's what we've got on the agenda for today's program. Let's go ahead and get right to it. I hope you all enjoy what I have in store for you. All right, folks, so I want to give you an update to the $3.5 trillion reconciliation package that Bernie Sanders and the Democratic Party is currently putting together. If you're wondering why I have an image of some random person behind me, well, you shouldn't really know who this person is. None of us should know who this person is or be concerned with who this individual is. But for those of you who don't recognize this face, this is the Senate parliamentarian, and her face is here because she represents a new chapter in the never-ending saga of will they or won't they pass the $3.5 trillion reconciliation package. Now, before I describe how the Senate parliamentarian comes into play, I want to give you a general update. Not much has changed. I'm and I shouldn't say that things have changed, but the overall trajectory that we're on, I don't necessarily think has shifted that dramatically. We're seeing this game of chicken between corporate Democrats and progressive Democrats. Corporate Democrats want the bipartisan infrastructure proposal that the Senate passed, and they need leftists to support it. But leftists don't really like that but they want the reconciliation proposal, which contains a lot of really important things that would actually help the American people. So basically, we have corporate Democrats like Kirsten Sinema, Joe Manchin, some individuals in the House of Representatives aligning with Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, such as Kurt Schrader, Kathleen Rice, and they don't like certain elements of the reconciliation proposal, but they really want the bipartisan infrastructure deal to go through because that's essentially a corporate giveaway to their donors. Now, on the other side, you have leftists saying, we don't really care about the bipartisan infrastructure deal. We just want what's in the reconciliation package. So if you deny us that or try to water it down more, we're voting no on the bipartisan infrastructure deal. So you have this back and forth and nothing really has changed. That dynamic is still there. However, on the 27th of September, that's the deadline. That's when Nancy Pelosi agreed to allow a vote on the bipartisan infrastructure in the House. And I don't know what's going to happen because the reconciliation package hasn't been finished yet. They're still working out the details. So to allow a vote on the bipartisan infrastructure deal without the reconciliation deal simultaneously, I don't think leftists are going to go for that. At least they've been saying 
that they're not going to go for that. So I hope that they hold strong and they vote no on the bipartisan infrastructure deal if they don't get what they want in that $3.5 trillion reconciliation proposal. So that's basically where we're at now when it comes to negotiations. However, in the Senate, the parliamentarian is basically reviewing all of the policies, and she has decided that, you know what, the immigration reform that you included in that $3.5 trillion reconciliation proposal, it's actually not appropriate because it's not necessarily related to the budget. So because that's the case, I am recommending that you do not include that. And because the Senate parliamentarian has said this, well, all of a sudden the media and some Democrats are pretending as if her word is final, when in fact, that's not the case. So Politico broke the story of reporting, Democrats have been, quote, blocked from including immigration reform in their reconciliation bill, which was described as, quote, a blow to the party's efforts to enact immigration reform. They add, immediately after the news broke, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said Sunday evening that Democrats are deeply disappointed in the decision, but plan to meet with the Senate parliamentarian in the coming days and pursue other options. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Now, you probably already know what I'm going to say here because we had this conversation before when the Senate parliamentarian said that you can't include a minimum wage increase in the last uh, proposal that was passed using budget reconciliation. Um, so, you know, you might know what I'm going to say, but if you don't, spoiler alert, what the Senate parliamentarian says doesn't matter. It's not like she's blocking Democrats from including the immigration reform aspect in their $3.5 trillion reconciliation proposal. This is merely a recommendation. The Senate parliamentarian can easily be overrided or fired, but it doesn't really matter. Like, this isn't necessarily a news story, but the way that it's being portrayed to people is as if, oh, well, this is just a roadblock in Democrats' plans to pursue immigration reform when that's not actually the case. I'll give you an example, not just the political article, but uh, this CNN segment where they made it seem as if, oh, well, this is it. This is the end of the line. Immigration reform can't be included in the reconciliation bill. Take a look. Um, we learned, Maggie, uh, that the Biden administration, obviously, overnight, is having another issue that kind of contributes to the domestic agenda hits that he's been taking. Senate Democrats they're not going to be able to include a pathway to legalization for millions of immigrants in their huge, their $3.5 trillion bill after some new guidance from the Senate parliamentarian. Where does this put them? So they're, they're going to attempt to try to revisit this, Brianna. There are going to be, they, there's I think four different efforts um, that pro-immigration reform activists, uh, advocates have been making in terms of the Senate parliamentarian. They are going to come back at this. The White House made clear they're going to come back at this on other pieces, but certainly it is a hit. And it is also just a reminder that this White House is playing this sort of triangulation move of, you know, we're not going to have Congress, we're not going to push Congress to pass legislation. We are going to try other maneuvers because the majority is so slim and because there are so many members who might not go along with this, it avoids putting pressure on them. But at the end of the day, a key piece of immigration reform still doesn't get done. It's a blow any way you look at it, even for the people who say they were expecting it. Yeah, this, look, this is, this is key, John, to President Biden's agenda. He wants to move this thing along. And here you see that roadblocks are coming up against it. They absolutely are. I think it shows the limits to larding up what you can pass in reconciliation. I don't think folks should get over themselves and say, you know, the Biden agenda is doomed. But there are some serious hurdles, and this dream has a deadline on it. And the Biden, Biden administration needs to be totally focused on passing this. You can't make the perfect enemy the good. I think they know that. They need to start acting that way. That last line was basically directed right at progressives. Look. You're getting some stuff, right? So shut the fuck up, take your crumbs, and and just give the corporate Democrats what they want. No. And that entire conversation was infuriating to me because what the Senate parliamentarian says, that's not the final word. I mean, do we ever hear about the importance of the Senate parliamentarian when Republicans are in control? When Donald Trump was in power, did you hear once about the Senate parliamentarian from any news outlet? Of course you didn't. But Democrats and the media, they're using this as a kind of scapegoat. But this entire conversation is a red herring, and it doesn't matter. The Biden administration can easily override the Senate parliamentarian. The VP can override the Senate parliamentarian. But the only reason why this feels as if we're getting blocked from including immigration in the reconciliation bill is because we know the Biden administration doesn't want 
to override the parliamentarian, which is stupid. But listen to what the CNN host said. Uh, quote, they're going, they're not going to be able to include a pathway to legalization for millions of immigrants. And then she says, after some uh, new guidance from the Senate parliamentarian. So, like, it's it, it's given away in their own language, right? Oh, well, they're not going to be able to include immigration because of this guidance. What does a guidance mean? Like, look up the definition of guidance. It doesn't mean that this is, like, the law of the land. This is an unelected official. What she says, it's not law. <laughs> so, I, I just don't understand why they're choosing to portray this this way. Uh, the other person, Ma Maggie Haberman, said, it's a blow any way you look at it, even for the people who uh, say that they were expecting it. No, it's not. Who cares what the Senate parliamentarian says? Override what she says. Rather than just suggesting that this is it and the Senate parliamentarian's word is final, CNN should be educating their audience about the reality of the situation. And the reality is that Democrats, they hold control of the House, the Senate, and the White House. This is only an obstacle if they allow it to be an obstacle. And Ilhan Omar was absolutely correct when she tweeted this out. This ruling by the parliamentarian is only a recommendation. Senator Schumer and the White House can and should ignore it. We can't miss this once in a lifetime opportunity to do the right thing. And she's exactly right. The Democratic Party is trying to use the parliamentarian as a scapegoat as their sort of excuse as to why they didn't accomplish immigration reform if they aren't indeed able to get it done before 2022 and 2024. But that's all it is. It's an excuse. As this meme from Go Left puts it, this is basically the Senate parliamentarian's authority. And if you're wondering what specifically the role of the Senate parliamentarian is, this article from Common Dreams breaks it down. So Jake Johnson explains in a three-page opinion, Senate parliamentarian Elizabeth McDonough advised against the inclusion of Democrats' immigration proposal in the emerging reconciliation package, arguing the measure amounts to a policy change that substantially outweighs the budgetary impact of that change. Under current Senate rules, which the parliamentarian is tasked with interpreting, all provisions of a reconciliation bill must have a direct and not merely incidental impact on the federal budget, a highly subjective criterion that most recently sparked intense debate in the context of a proposal to raise long stagnant minimum wage. The Democratic majority is using the arcane reconciliation process to work around the Senate's 60-vote filibuster rule, which a number of conservative Democrats are refusing to repeal. Last week, McDonough heard arguments from both Democrats and Republicans on the immigration proposal, which would establish a path to citizenship for around 8 million dreamers, farm workers, temporary protected status recipients, and essential workers. Democrats contend that by making millions of people newly eligible for public programs, the change would have a substantial impact on the federal budget, an argument that policy experts have echoed. And that's the extent of it. It's a recommendation, as Ilhan Omar put it. It doesn't matter at the end of the day. So the mere fact that we're even hearing about the Senate parliamentarian at this point, when most people who heard about the Senate parliamentarian for the first time now know that she doesn't matter, it just shows that there is a failure on the mainstream media to educate people. Don't let the Democrats get away with this. You should be blasting Democrats like Chuck Schumer who view this ruling as disappointing. Who cares what the Senate parliamentarian says? Again, let me throw the meme up on the screen another time. That's the roadblock presented by the Senate parliamentarian. It doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Now ask yourself this. When the Senate parliamentarian previously ruled against what the Republican Party wanted, what do you think they did? Do you think that they like talked about how disappointed they were that, you know, this this was the outcome. No, that's not what they did. They did what you'd expect a party in power to do who wants to get things accomplished. They overrode the Senate parliamentarian. Jake Johnson explains on Twitter, Representative Rashida Tlaib alluded to Republicans' 2001 decision to fire then parliamentarian Robert Dove after he insisted a pair of recommendations that threatened the GOP's tax cuts for the rich. Quote, an unelected person isn't a real barrier to the much needed investments we were elected to make, Tlaib wrote. Ignore this ruling or get a new one. The GOP didn't hesitate when they pushed their corporate agenda agenda. Exactly. If this Senate parliamentarian doesn't think that immigration should be included in the budget reconciliation process because it doesn't directly impact the federal budget, find someone who thinks it does impact the federal budget directly. This isn't that difficult of an issue. And any time we hear about the Senate parliamentarian's rulings, remind people that this does not matter. What the Senate parliamentarian says is Nothing more than a recommendation and a recommendation that can indeed be overridden. The reason why it's not being overridden is because Biden doesn't want to do this.
They didn't want to do this before when it came to the minimum wage and their unwillingness to override the parliamentarian. Now, it doesn't necessarily signal that they've been blocked from doing this. It signals that they don't actually want to be serious when it comes to passing immigration reform. Now, Democrats are saying that they're going to pursue alternate paths. That's what Chuck Schumer is saying. Okay, maybe they'll attach this to some other bill or proposal but either way if they don't get it done and that reconciliation bill passes and it excludes immigration reform this is a failure on democrats not on republicans not on the senate parliamentarian but on democrats who didn't want to actually fight when this isn't even that much of a fight fire the parliamentarian stop talking about the senate parliamentarian for the love of god haiti is in a state of crisis they just experienced another catastrophic earthquake. This time, it was 7.2 magnitude. The last earthquake that they experienced was in 2010, and many Haitians still haven't fully recovered from that disaster. Many had to flee the country. But on top of that, they are experiencing political instability and political violence due to the assassination of their president. So many people have either lost everything or they no longer feel safe in Haiti because of all of the violence, and thousands have chosen to flee the country. And many have come to the United States. They arrived in Mexico and then they crossed the border. And there's about 14 to 15,000 currently camped under a bridge in a Texan border town. And what they're hoping for is to be able to make their case for asylum. Many have been here for days and many are starving and they're hoping for a chance at a new life. But before I get into the specifics here, I just want to give you a broad sense of what's happening. This is an on the ground report that gives us some additional context. But keep in mind, by the time you see this video, the numbers and details may have already changed. But nonetheless, here's a general overview of basically what's happening on the ground right now. I can tell you this is a very dynamic situation that has changed drastically over the last 48 hours. If you ask Border Patrol, they will tell you that uh, some of this may stem back to that 2010 earthquake in Haiti, which sent many people immigrating to South America. And then following the 2016 Rio Olympics, where many of those folks worked, they then started that long process north. But as what's happening right here, right now, the only border crossing into Mexico in Del Rio remains closed down, and it is a 24-7 mission. We're just on the side of the border fence, and we are seeing agency after agency agency drive through this gate manned by the National Guard. You see Border Patrol trucks, you see customs vehicles here. This is just part of the massive response we've seen from authorities here uh, in response to a group that essentially tripled in size in just a matter of days. Go back to last Wednesday, the group beneath that bridge, about 5,000 strong. At last check over the weekend, 15,000 people were essentially calling the shade of this border bridge home. The goal right now, trying to process every single one of those people, some of those bus to nearby processing facilities that are not overwhelmed, others being uh, flown on what they're calling lateral flights uh, to do that same thing. And then we've already confirmed over the weekend that those first deportation flights have already begun, three of which took off from San Antonio to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, but there are still so many people, that whole group that flew back, about 300 staff, we still have at least 10,000 Haitian migrants uh, beneath this bridge. We were granted exclusive access yesterday, had a chance to speak to one woman. She said she had been under that bridge for eight days, had barely eaten a thing. We had seen food and water handouts there set up by the Border Patrol. But, I mean, the supplies cannot come fast enough right now to try to take care of these people. Just minutes before we spoke to you, there was an ambulance here outside that a woman from a Border Patrol vehicle was transferred into and taken away. And unfortunately, that has been an all too common sight here. So this is very obviously a huge humanitarian crisis. These people are starving. These people are desperate. And all they want is to be able to make their case for asylum. So, of course, you know, the very compassionate Biden administration is greeting them with a welcoming message and is telling them, listen, we're trying to process your cases as quickly as possible. That's that's what's happening. Right. And so the Biden administration is currently trying to direct resources to this area to feed and process all of these asylum seekers. Right. No, of course not. That's not what's happening. In fact, the message is the opposite. And I think you probably predicted that and you probably knew, knew that I was being facetious because the DHS secretary sent a very clear message. Get out. We don't want you here. If you come to the United States illegally, you will be returned. Your journey will not succeed and you will be endangering your life and your family's lives. 
this administration is committed to developing safe, orderly, and humane pathways for migration. But this is not the way to do it. Okay, so nobody else should come. Got it. But that doesn't change the fact that 14 to 15,000 people are already here and they're currently under a bridge. And I would argue that the overwhelming majority have a very compelling case for why they should be granted asylum. So what do you do? What, what do you do to mitigate their suffering? Well, of course, if you're the United States, you do the most American thing ever. You uh, launch a mass expulsion campaign to send them all back to Haiti as quickly as possible. And according to AP, this could be one of America's swiftest large-scale expulsions of migrants or refugees in decades. Yeah. So how do you how do you do this? If you aren't going to allow them to make their case or not allow most of them to make their case for asylum, how do you do something like this? Like, how do you pull this off in a humane way? And the answer is you don't. You herd these people into planes back to Haiti as if they're animals. And if need be, you literally whip them. That's what we're doing. That's quite literally what's what's taking place in the Rio Grande currently. U.S. Border Patrol agents on horses are trying to herd Haitians, drive them out back into Mexico or onto planes, and they're literally physically abusing them with whips. Vice News's Emily Green describes the scene. Border Patrol officers on horseback swinging whips in the faces of Haitians. Families with toddlers scrambling across the Rio Grande back into Mexico to avoid being deported. Haitian parents crying as they faced the prospect of being deported home to a social and political crisis that seems to see no end. Those were among the scenes in the town of Del Rio, Texas, over the weekend as the U.S. government took a hardline stance against thousands of newly arrived Haitian migrants seeking protection. The situation is becoming a public relations and humanitarian challenge for U.S. President Joe Biden's administration as images of Border Patrol agents on horseback screaming at and chasing desperate Haitians reverberated across the internet. Quote, this is why your country's shit, because you use your women for this, one officer on horseback shouted at a group of Haitian women who were crossing the Rio Grande with bags of food, showed one report by Al Jazeera. The situation along the southwest Texas border at the entrance to Del Rio is becoming a bigger problem by the day for President Biden, who is trying to assert control over the international line while fulfilling his promise to take a more humanitarian approach to immigration. Well, you've already failed miserably on that regard, Joe. So, I mean, I don't understand why you even maintain this facade that you're more compassionate than your predecessor. When we see scenes of Haitian migrants who are desperately seeking asylum getting whipped by Border Patrol agents on your watch, I mean, why even pretend? You've already gone full mask off, so stop pretending as if you care. The truth is, the United States government does not care. We don't even care about our own people. We're letting thousands of people every single year die due to a lack of basic access to health care, due to uh, housing. So, of course, we don't care about these immigrants. In fact, we don't even acknowledge that they're human beings. We treat them like animals, quite literally. So it's just truly disgusting. And, and to make matters worse, as Biden tries to claim or present himself as a more compassionate like, and moral president, he's literally using a rule created by the Trump administration to expel immigrants in a very quick manner. So as Julia Conley of Common Dreams explains, the Biden administration launched the deportations of the migrants under Title 42, a section of the Public Health Safety Act, which former President Donald Trump invoked during the pandemic to quickly expel asylum seekers from the country. President Joe Biden has drawn international condemnation for continuing the policy. Yeah, and I just want to remind you that this is taking place under a Democratic administration. Joe Biden's administration is literally using using a Trump era rule to expel these migrants as quickly as possible. And you can't expel a large group of people in a compassionate and humane way if you want to do it quickly. I mean, it's not a humanitarian thing to do, period. If they're literally seeking asylum, I think that they should be able to make their case. But to do this rapidly, of course, there's going to be human rights abuses. And so a lot of you are going to see the images, which are absolutely disturbing, of Haitian migrants being whipped by U.S. Border Patrol agents on horses, and that's gross. But even if they weren't whipped by Border Patrol agents or harassed and assaulted by them, they're still being treated like criminals. So, so rather than being treated as if they're seeking asylum, you know, we should treat asylum seekers with respect and dignity and, and respond to their needs. But that's not happening. They're reporting that they're being handcuffed and some of them are being lied to. 
So they're saying, hey, get on this plane. We'll take you to Florida. And rather than going to Florida in hopes that their case will be processed at a facility there, they're getting deported back to Haiti. And Haiti is calling on a humanitarian moratorium on these deportations because they're saying, listen, we're in crisis mode currently. We can't take in thousands of deportees when we're dealing with the crisis from the assassination of our president with the earthquake. What are we supposed to do with thousands of people who are coming back to this country perhaps worse off than they were when they left? There's no homes for them. Like, wh what do you want us to do? So rather than doing the humane thing and at least temporarily halting these deportations, the United States government at this point is uh, not doing that. And they're making Haiti's crisis even worse. I mean, it's not like we don't have the resources to assist them here. This isn't that many people in the grand scheme of things. At a minimum, perhaps at least try to hear out their claims for asylum because I think that most of them, if not all of them, will be compelling. But I mean, if you're wondering, what do we do? When it comes to these sort uh, sorts of crises, there's never an easy answer. By now, with how old our country is, with how many times this has happened and will continue to happen in the, in the future, especially with anthropogenic climate change, you know, we should have some sort of a system in place, but whenever this happens, whenever we see a large influx of migrants, we immediately freak out. And if there's a Republican in power, then that Republican president is going to be as cruel as possible. And if there is a Democratic administration in power when this happens, that administration is also going to be as cruel as possible, worrying that, you know, if he's not actually uh, harsh enough at expelling these immigrants, that, you know, uh, the insane xenophobic Republicans are going to freak out and claim that he's too weak. It's just it's so disgusting. So, you know, when it comes to the question of what do we do, uh, why don't we just start by like not treating them literally like animals and whipping them? That's like a really, really basic thing to start with. Maybe don't whip them. Maybe acknowledge that like us, they're human beings with desires, with fears, with ambitions. And maybe not whipping them is a really great place to start. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm crazy. Right now, thankfully, lawmakers have spoken out. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, they all have condemned the whipping here because these are scenes that we shouldn't be seeing from a so-called compassionate administration. We shouldn't be seeing this, but we are. And that isn't necessarily that surprising because the only thing really that has changed with regard to our stance on immigration is the rhetoric. Joe Biden doesn't go out of his way to fearmonger about immigrants, but he still treats them like garbage. He still doesn't acknowledge their basic humanity, doesn't care at all, is totally unmoved by their claims of asylum, which when you see all of the things happening in Haiti currently, why can't we hear out their cases? So it's just, you know, over and over again, we see this and this situation is only going to continue to get worse as we start seeing the issue of climate refugees pop up. So, um, you know, if you're disturbed by seeing these images, then that's good. Don't try to run away from these images. Acknowledge that this is taking place under a democratic administration and use this anger that you're feeling when you see these images to fight for a better world, for fight to fight for actually a humane response to migrants, especially ones that are seeking asylum, which is a human right, by the way. Mr. Black, when are you going to apologize for the million Iraqis that are dead because you lied? You lied about weapons of mass destruction. You lied about connections to 9-11. You lied about Iraq being a threat. You sent me to Iraq. You sent me to Iraq in 2003. My friends are dead. Joshua Castile. You, you killed people. You lied. You lied about WMD. A million Iraqis are dead because you lied. My friends are dead because you lied. You need to apologize. Apologize. You need to apologize. 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 Are you with this gentleman? No. What just happened? Uh, I'm wondering if they're going to arrest me, but I just disrupted George Bush speaking. Um, they dragged me out. Uh, uh, I guess the cops are not after me, so I, I guess I'm not arrested. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, well, what I did was I tried to read the names of friends of mine who uh, died after going to Iraq and then uh, died of um, injuries they came home with. Um, the names of Iraqis who were killed by the U.S. occupation in the Nisor Square massacre. 
Aditha, those you saw in the collateral murder video. Um, I tried to read the names, but the event runners immediately grabbed the list and tore it up. Uh, but I was able to shut it down for a little while, right when Bush was getting into his first little cheesy story about um, his life and all that, trying to be funny. But uh, so hopefully I shook him and set a tone for the event. The crowd was very mad. Um, typical crowd you would expect for George W. Bush, but they seem to not be expecting it at all. And um, here we are. So uh, tried not to give them a little moment of peace because no one else gets it who is touched by the war. That was a Rock War veteran and Empire Files producer Mike Preisner doing what I think is absolutely courageous and commendable, confronting war criminal George W. Bush at a speech that he was giving in Beverly Hills. Now, there is so much about that clip that I hated. I mean, I loved that Mike uh, decided to confront him, but the fact that people showed up to listen to George W. Bush in the first place irritates me, but they literally booed when Mike Preisner called out the WMD lie that led to a million Iraqi deaths, they booed him. I mean, maybe you want to hear George W. Bush speak because he's a former president, but you know about the fact that he's a war criminal. Well, it seems like they don't actually really care. They, they literally booed him when he called out this lie that led to a million deaths. Like, every single person in that room has got to be a sociopath. Like, I'm just going to assume that they're all bad people and shitty people to even want to hear George W. Bush. But the fact that some people would boo Mike Preisner, I mean, that's just, that's, that's gross. I don't know what else to say about that. That's just, that's disgusting. Fuck those people. Fuck every single person who was there who unironically wanted to hear George W. Bush speak. Now, getting to George W. Bush himself, who should be riding in a jail cell for the rest of his life, he literally laughed off what Mike Preisner said. Did you hear it? So I don't know that I have the exact thing that he said, but he did say something about behaving yourself, and I listened to this again and again and again, and this is what it sounded like he was saying to Mike Preisner. Senator Kerry, you said you'd behave yourself. He was saying this to Mike Preisner. So basically, he was cracking a joke about the fact that in the 2004 presidential election, when he was running against John Kerry, John Kerry called him out for the lie, the WMD lie that led to the Iraq war that was the basis for the invasion of Iraq. And John Kerry is no saint. He voted for the Iraq war himself, which I think is just unforgivable. But He's basically trying to joke about the fact that, oh, well, this is a tired conversation. Mike, what you're saying is the same thing I heard in 2004 from John Kerry. Like, you said you'd behave yourself, Senator Kerry. I think that's what he said. But either way, even the hint that this person who's confronting a war criminal should behave themselves. No, you should behave yourself. Go fuck yourself, George Bush. You killed a million people. You lied. And that lie led to a million deaths, and he's not remorseful at all. Like, we didn't see the look on his face, but clearly he didn't care. He was unmoved because he was laughing as somebody called out the lies. I mean, you had to have heard Mike say that he was there. His friends died. A million Iraqis died. But George Bush literally couldn't care less. And this isn't the first time that he's joked about this. When he was still president, he literally joked about not being able to find WMDs. I'm not kidding about this. Take a look. <laughs> Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. <laughs> nope, no weapons over there. <laughs> Maybe under here. <laughs> Yeah, so he has no remorse whatsoever. He doesn't care about the fact that he has blood on his hands. He does not care. And yet we have the media parading him around, rehabilitating his image as if he's some sort of moral authority on what is and isn't good policy in the United States. Why are we listening to him again? It's literally just because the GOP has gotten so demonstrably insane that when you look at someone like George W. Bush, who isn't necessarily frothing at the mouth, but is more insidious in the threat that he poses and more, um, you know, more <sighs> respectable in the bad things that he does, since he's kind of like this antithesis to Trump and since he's anti-Trump, the media thinks, oh, well, great, we should 
parade George W. Bush around. And that really, it speaks to the moral bankruptcy of the ruling class in the United States, the political elites, media elites in the United States. Because to rehabilitate somebody who is a mass murderer, I just... I don't know what to say about that. Now, to give you some additional details, this is what Mike Preisner tweeted out. Almost 20 years after he sent me to Iraq, I disrupted George W. Bush's speech tonight. I tried to read a list of names, mostly of Iraqis killed, as well as my friends who became anti-war activists after Iraq, who then died of suicide or other war wounds. They ripped up my list. Also on my list of names, the victims in the collateral murder video, the Nassar Square massacre, as well as U.S. troops killed in Iraq, whose parents then formed the powerful anti-war organization gold star families for peace bush should never know peace for the lives he destroyed couldn't have done this without my comrade marissa who helped sneak us in and filmed we assumed we'd both be arrested and our crew answer coalition holding a protest outside and running our support logistics we are not yet in the clear legally just learned the event organizers were irate that the police did not arrest us so every single event where george w bush speaks or is invited to that event should be shut down he should fear ever showing his disgusting face in public because this man is a sociopathic mass murderer. And the fact that he has his freedom after he took so many lives, but yet Mike Preisner has to fear that he's going to be arrested because he confronted this mass murderer. Like, it shows how fucked up and ass-backwards our society is. Now, for those of you who are unaware of how Mike Preisner kind of, like, came to this current status where he's been radicalized. He's this anti-war activist. Well, it was because of his experience in Iraq. Now, this is about 10 years old, but this clip, it kind of gives us some insight into the things that he shares about like what he had to do when he was serving in Iraq, and it's truly gut-wrenching. Take a look. And we've heard a lot about different raids and kicking down the doors of people's houses and, and ransacking their houses. But this mission was, was different, a different kind of raid. Uh, I never got any explanation for these orders. We were only told that this, this group of houses, five or six houses, uh, were now property of the U.S. military, and we had to go in and make those families leave those houses. So we went to these houses and informed the families that those homes were no longer their homes. Uh, we provided them no alternative, nowhere to go, no compensation, uh, and they are very confused and very scared. and, and did not know what to do and would not leave, so we had to remove them from those houses. Uh, one family in particular, a woman with two small girls, a very elderly man and, and two middle-aged men, um, we, we dragged them from their houses and, and threw them onto the street and arrested the men because they refused to leave, uh, arrested the old man and sent them off to prison. And at that time, I, I didn't know what happened to people when we, we tied their hands behind their back and, and put a sandbag on their head. But uh, unfortunately, a, a few months later, I, I, I had to find out. I was, we were short interrogators, so I was assigned to, to work as an interrogator. And uh, I oversaw and participated in uh, hundreds of, of interrogations. One in particular I'm going to share with you is, it was, it was a, a moment for me that, that, that really showed me the, the nature of, of this occupation. Um, this, this particular uh, detainee, um, when I was uh, sent to interrogate him, he was stripped down to his underwear, um, hands behind his back and, and sandbag on his head. Uh, I never actually saw this man's face. Um, my job was to take this metal folding chair and just smash it against the wall next to his head. He was, he was faced against the wall with his nose touching the wall. While a fellow soldier screamed the same question over and over again, no matter what his answer, my job was to slam the chair against his wall. Um, we did this until basically we got tired. And I was told to make sure he stood against the wall uh, for however long. And I was guarding this prisoner. And my job was to make sure he kept standing up. But something was wrong with his leg. He was, he was injured. And he kept like, stuck, like falling to the ground. Uh, and my, the sergeant in charge would, would come and, and tell me to, to get him up off his feet. So we'd, I'd have to pick him up and put him against the wall. And oh, he kept going down. I just have to keep pulling him up and putting him against the wall. And my sergeant came along, and, and he 
was upset with me for not, you know, continue to stand. Uh, he picked him up and, and slammed him against the wall several times. Um, and then he left, and, and when the man went down on the ground again, I noticed blood pouring down from under the sandbag. Uh, and so I let him sit, and when I noticed my sergeant coming again, I would tell him that quickly to stand up. And then I realized that I was supposed to be guarding my unit from this detainee, and at that point I realized I was guarding the detainee from my unit. And I tried hard to be proud of my service, but all I could feel was shame, and racism could no longer mask the reality of the occupation. These were people, these were human beings. I've since been plagued by guilt anytime I see an elderly man, like the one who couldn't walk, who he rolled onto his stretcher and told the Iraqi police to take him away. I feel guilt anytime I see a mother with her children, like the one who cried hysterically and screamed that we are worse than Saddam as we forced her from her home. I feel guilt anytime I see a young girl, like the one I grab by the arm and drag into the street. We were told we were fighting terrorists. The real terrorist was me, and the real terrorism is this occupation. That is why he is a staunch anti-war veteran. I've seen this speech before, but every single time I watch it, it really gets to me because the things that happen there, like you, you hear the emotion and the pain and the regret in Mike's voice, but when you hear George W. Bush, like contrast that with him and there's nothing, no regret whatsoever, no uh, feeling of remorse for all of the lives that he took, no feeling of um, guilt whatsoever. So what kind of a weird world is it that we live in to where an Iraq war veteran who is trying to shed light on the atrocities that we were committing, this person is going to go to jail possibly because he confronted this mass murderer, but the mass murderer gets to speak. The mass murderer gets to be paraded around as if he's some sort of a hero. The mass murderer has thousands of people who still want to hear what he has to say when nobody should be listening to what he has to say. It's just, it, it's really gross. And really, this is one of the things that really made me lose faith in America. I mean, there was never really this time where I, I felt like the United States government respected human rights, but the blatant disregard for the suffering that we caused in Iraq and the refusal to hold the war criminals that caused this atrocity responsible, and the fact that we're parading them around as some sort of fucking heroes, that really, it, it just, like, it shows how morally bankrupt we are as a society. Like, it shows that we don't give a shit about human rights. The fact that there aren't more calls for him to be jailed, the fact that he's still getting invited to events, I don't care who you are, if you're a former president, if you're God, to do that much, to kill that many people, you should be barred from participating in society. You should be worried that people are going to throw tomatoes at you every single time you show your disgusting face in public. But the fact that he is still propped up as some sort of a hero is it, truly gross. So I absolutely have the utmost respect for Mike Preisner for doing what needs to be done, confronting this war criminal, calling him out, and reminding people about all the pain and suffering that he caused. It's just, I, there, there's no words for it. This is a monster. And the fact that there's never going to be justice for his victims, the fact that they'll never know that the person who terrorized them is going to be behind bars, it's really depressing to think about. So at this point, I don't think that any real leftist seriously believes that Tulsi Gabbard is progressive. I mean, at best, you could say that she's a centrist, but I think that functionally speaking, she's basically just a right-wing grifter at this point. I mean, this has been her trajectory ever since she abandoned her congressional seat to pursue her failed presidential campaign, which was extremely stupid, by the way. But she's even been hired by Rumble, a right-wing alternative to YouTube, to become an influencer. And she's getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars per year to, I mean, I'm assuming, warn her right-wing audience and astroturfed audience about the dangers of transgender high school athletes and how censorship is bad, unless, of course, we're talking about censoring BDS activists, because then it seems like she's gonna be on board for that form of censorship. So she's just, she's so strange. She's gone mask off multiple times. Even during her presidential campaign, she abandoned Medicare for All 
And now she is basically undermining one of the main reasons why people liked her, her anti-war stance. And there were a lot of red flags there. So whenever she talked about how anti-war she was, she would always use very interesting and deliberate rhetoric, right? She'd talk about how regime change war is bad, regime change war is bad, regime change war is bad. Okay, I get it. I agree with you technically. I do think that regime change wars are bad, but you don't have to add that caveat every single time. You can just say war is bad in general and we'll know that you also mean regime change wars. But there was a very specific reason why she said regime change war is bad and not all wars are bad. She also conspicuously never denounced U.S. imperialism, and there's a reason for this, because Tulsi Gabbard is a U.S. imperialist, and she also is pro-war. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can take her word for it, because she's going to tell you how pro-war she is on Tucker Carlson's program. Now, before I show you the video clip, I do want to give you some additional context. So last week, the U.S. military admitted that it killed 10 innocent civilians via a drone strike in Kabul. And Tucker Carlson in this segment is going to criticize the Biden administration for this, and rightly so in my opinion. But what's interesting to me is that Tucker Carlson said nothing when Donald Trump increased drone strikes overall by more than 400 percent so he is correct like i don't have an issue with him condemning drone strikes in fact i wish that more news pundits would do this but the hypocrisy is what i have an issue with so basically he's only talking about this he's only pretending to care because he's using this as an excuse to attack biden that's fine but he's going to bring in tulsi gabbard assuming that she's going to attack joe biden because this is the anti-war person supposedly right well, no, she's actually going to take this in a different direction, and she's going to defend drone strikes, literally. And she says a lot of other stuff that should make any actual leftist feel very, very uncomfortable. So for weeks, the Biden administration told us that a drone strike had killed a group of ISIS-K terrorists, whatever that is, in Kabul. And there were secondary explosions that proved they were suicide bombers, but they were lying forced by the New York Times to admit it, they've now conceded they killed a number of innocent people, including children. Here's the interesting part. Mistakes happen. But in this case, no one in the Pentagon has been punished for this mistake or for lying about it. We thought it'd be interesting to see what Tulsi Gabbard thinks about this. She's a former member of Congress from Hawaii. She served in Iraq as a member of the Hawaii Army National Guard. She's still serving the country in the military. She joins us tonight. Congresswoman, thanks so much for coming on. So you Thanks, get to lie, I mean, this will not shock you because you've seen it so much, but you get to lie about the loss of human life, you get caught and nothing happens to you? What kind of system is that? I mean, this kind of accountability is critical. I, I wanna point out first that anytime there are civilian casualties in war, it is tragic and terrible. Yeah. War is a terrible thing. And, and I think it's important for the American people to understand that Islamist jihadists are continuing to wage war against us. And the Islamist ideology, not the same as the religion of Islam, but this Islamist ideology, which is a political ideology that inspired the terrorist attacks on our country on 9-11, uh, is, is the greatest threat that we're facing right now in this country and the world. It is the foundation of governance of so-called Islamic countries like Turkey and Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia and, and Pakistan. Uh, and it's what's behind the discriminatory policies that they have in these countries against Christians, uh, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, and others. So as long as these Islamist jihadists are waging war against us, we have to work to defeat them militarily and ideologically. And militarily, we have two choices in how we do that. Number one, we can continue to invade and occupy and nation build in countries around the world, just as we did in Afghanistan at great cost. Number two, we can take a targeted approach using airstrikes, using our special forces to go in and go after these terrorist cells. The reality is that the cost, the cost to the American people, the cost to our troops, the cost to civilians will be far less if we take this very targeted approach to go after these jihadist terrorist cells than if we continue making the very same mistakes that we saw in Afghanistan and other parts of the world of invasion, occupation, and nation building. Yeah, so make no mistake about it. When she said on the campaign trail that she was against regime change wars, it's because she literally just had a tactical disagreement. She thought that regime change wars weren't a good way to facilitate her ultimate goal. 
And what she just did there was endorse drone strikes. Just a couple of weeks ago, Air Wars released a report showing that the U.S. government killed between 22,000 and 48,000 innocent civilians. And yet she is, just weeks later, advocating for drone strikes on national television. This is your anti-war candidate? Will any of the leftists who boosted her ever admit that they were wrong about her? <laughs> <laughs> Now, she says, uh, Islamist jihadists are continuing to wage wars against us. That's why she believes we should continue to do our illegal drone policy in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia. And um, she says that uh, the greatest th uh, threat that we're facing right now in the country and in the world is uh, jihadism. She said that with a straight face. She said, it is the greatest threat we're facing right now in the country and the world. First of all, I would argue that the U.S. government, that is the biggest terrorist threat in the world. But when it comes to threats that the world is facing, how can you say that with a straight face, knowing that climate change could literally eradicate our entire species, not just a human species, but all types of species. Tree species are going extinct. Animal species. Plants. I mean, I don't think that she's actually dumb. I think that she's just extremely disingenuous. And by saying this to Tucker Carlson's right-wing audience, they don't believe in climate change, so they think, oh, wow, she must be correct. So she knows who she's speaking to, but it's just to say something like that is so embarrassing. The fact that she said that with a straight face... I mean, it says everything you need to know about Tulsi Gabbard. Also, um, she says that when it comes to the Islamist uh, jihadists, we have to work to defeat them militarily and ideologically. So she's already telling you, here's what we can do. We have no choice. We have to go after them. So we can either wage regime change wars, which we all know she hates, or, quote, we can take a targeted approach using airstrikes. She is quite literally endorsing the use of drones which have single-handedly killed tens of thousands of innocent civilians. How does she sleep at night? This is the anti-war politician that everyone was waiting for? She's endorsing drones. And the drone strike that she was brought on to discuss specifically, the fact that she had absolutely no remorse whatsoever and didn't even address it, sidestepped it to talk about how bad Muslims were, it's just, it's beyond the pale for me. These are the victims, some of the victims killed by that drone strike. On the top left, those two little boys were nine and 10 years old. Now on the bottom in the middle, those two children in the orange sweaters, they were three and four years old. The little girl on the bottom right, she was just two years old. Tulsi said in that clip that we have to use drones because this Islamist jihadist threat so, you know, we use drones because they reduce the costs. Tell the families of those victims, tell the family of that little girl who was two years old, Tulsi, that these drone strikes reduce costs. Say it to their faces, I dare you, you fucking fraud. You wouldn't do that because you know it's not true. You're lying. You're lying. You don't care about them. What a fucking fraud. By now... If anyone is still boosting Tulsi Gabbard and they claim that they're on the left, acknowledge that they're either dumb or disingenuous. And for anyone, any political commentator who actually endorsed Tulsi Gabbard and campaigned for Tulsi Gabbard and boosted Tulsi Gabbard, maybe we shouldn't trust their judgment. Maybe these folks should uh, admit that they were wrong and apologize to their audiences. People in America aren't going to be killed by some fucking terrorist attack by a jihadist they're more likely to die due to covid due to a lack of health insurance or climate change so i mean tulsi gabbard at this point is a joke but you know if you didn't know this by now then there's there's no plausible deniability left i mean she's gone full mask off when somebody tells you who they are believe them so when it comes to the spread of misinformation regarding the COVID-19 pandemic and the vaccines, I think that most reasonable people know by now that Fox News has been one of, if not the worst offenders here. And it's not like they mostly get it right, but seldomly get something wrong. 
No, every single night they are spreading disinformation about the COVID-19 pandemic. As Media Matters' Matthew Gertz points out here, they do this every single night. And you could see various examples of how they will fearmonger about kids getting the COVID-19 vaccine. They will fearmonger about vaccine mandates, any mitigation measure that a local government might put into place to stop the spread of the virus, be it mask mandates or social distancing. They're against that, too. And this is all especially nefarious, knowing what we know about Fox News. 90 percent of Fox News employees are vaccinated. In fact, their vaccine requirements are even more stringent than the ones put into place by the Biden administration, which their network's hosts condemn all the time. So they're knowingly lying to millions and millions of people every single night, and they're all intelligent enough to be aware of the consequences of their misinformation. In fact, their disinformation is deadly, literally. And we have an example to point out how dangerous what they say is, because one man actually listened to Tucker Carlson. He took his advice, didn't get vaccinated. He contracted COVID-19 and he died. And this man's family believes that this disinformation sold by people like Tucker Carlson is the reason why he was vaccine hesitant. Take a look. Yeah, uh, it was one month ago that he was completely healthy, helping me move all my furniture into my first apartment, uh, doing all the heavy lifting for me. And he moved you in. This is your first apartment at college, I might add. He moved you in there. He stayed the night with you. And what did he say to you as, as he was leaving? Uh, he gave me a, a really big hug and he said, I I'm proud of you, Katie Bug. And he walked out my front door and if I had known that that was going to be my last time seeing my dad in person, alive and well, I, I don't think I would have left go, let go of him. No. Why was he so hesitant to get vaccinated, Katie? Uh, there, there's multiple reasons, I think. Uh, one of which was some of the media that he ingested. He wasn't by any means far right. He was right in the middle and he consumed media from both sides and just some of the misinformation on one of those sides made him hesitant. So he was going to wait for FDA approval, but by the time that Pfizer had been approved, it was already too late. Pfizer got the full FDA approval and your father was already sick. Evan, talk to me about your final goodbye to your father. Did you have a chance to spend any real time with him? Not really. I was already staying at another house and he was just coming by to pick something up and he didn't even want to get too close because he was too worried about getting me sick so I didn't even get to hug him before he left and then before I knew he was gone. You guys are vaccinated now, Evan. You know, what, what was the message ultimately that your father wanted to spread about vaccines? He wasn't anti-vaccine. He was just hesitant. And I, now that, you know, Pfizer has been FDA approved, I don't think he would have anything wrong with telling people to get that vaccine. He, uh, his final words to my stepmom on a FaceTime call was that, he wishes, he wished that he was vaccinated. Those were his final words? Uh, to my stepmom, uh, the last call that she had with him, he said that he wished that he was vaccinated. And Katie, you said from one media source in particular, he was getting misinformation, or he was getting information that led him to be hesitant on vaccines. Who? I mean, who was he listening to? Uh, he, he watched some Tucker Carlson videos on YouTube, uh, and some of those videos involved some misinformation about vaccines, mm. and I believe that that played a role. Misinformation and disinformation is always going to be harmful, but during a pandemic, it quite literally is deadly, and that proves it. This is someone who, as his children described, he wasn't like some far-right loon. He wasn't necessarily explicitly anti-vax, but he was vaccine-hesitant because of people like Tucker Carlson, who claim, mm, there's some stuff about the vaccines that, you know, the government just isn't telling you. Maybe you should be afraid. So he was waiting for it to get full FDA approval, but by then it was too late. 
He got COVID-19 and he died because he listened to people like Tucker Carlson. He watched YouTube videos featuring Tucker Carlson and he died. And his last words were um, that he wished he would have gotten the vaccine. That's what he told that girl's stepmom. Tucker Carlson quite literally is partially to blame for this man's death. Is Tucker Carlson going to pay for this family's funeral expenses or any healthcare costs? Of course not. Tucker Carlson is going to find out about this story. He's going to know that these children blame him for their dad's death. But do you think he's going to care? Of course not. He's not going to have any trouble sleeping at night whatsoever because Tucker Carlson, he knows what he's doing. This is all about ratings to him and other Fox News propagandists, right? They know that if they were to actually inform their viewers about how the vaccines are in actuality safe and effective, that they would be angry, right? Every single person who watches Fox News tunes in every single night because they want their biases to be confirmed. They want the Fox News hosts to tell them what they want to hear. So they're not going to lose their ratings and, you know, tell them what they should hear. They're just going to lie to them. And those lies have consequences. Those consequences are deadly. And the misinformation never stops with Tucker Carlson. Just this last week on Monday, he said this about the COVID-19 vaccines. The point of mandatory vaccination is to identify the sincere Christians in the ranks, the free thinkers, the men with high testosterone levels, and anyone else who does not love Joe Biden and make them leave immediately. It's a takeover of the U.S. military. Here's how they're doing it. This show has just obtained a PowerPoint that the army is using to justify mandatory vaccines to the troops. This is an actual slide from it on your screen. You will notice there the sympathetic portrayal of Satanism. How many children were sacrificed to Satan because of the vaccine? The slide reads apparently sarcastically. Then the presentation proceeds to list the so-called tenets of Satanism, which are taken straight from the Temple of Satanism website. So here you have the United States Army doing PR for Satanism. The rest of the presentation is less shocking than that, but it's utterly shoddy and dishonest. For example, it falsely claims that only three people have died from taking the COVID vaccine. Reports collected by the Biden administration itself indicate that number is actually in the thousands. So you were just blasted with so much misinformation, it would take me hours to unpack all of it. But we'll get to that last line in particular, which was especially troubling. But think about what he's subtly suggesting here. These vaccine mandates, they target Christians, and this is being peddled by Satan worshipers, right? So if Christians are being targeted and the people targeting them are Satan worshipers, and they're trying to force you to take this vaccine, maybe it's, you know, similar to them forcing you to take the mark of the beast. Maybe these vaccines are basically the mark of the beast. There's been some far-right evangelical pastors who has uh, floated this, but that's what Tucker Carlson is priming people to believe. He's not explicitly saying it because he knows there'd be a lot of backlash. So he's kind of just like nudging you in that direction to make you think yourself, oh, maybe these vaccines are the mark of the beast. If they're being pushed by Satan worshipers, I don't want it. Do we even know what he's talking about? No. Is the military actually like sending out uh, documents and slideshows talking about the core tenets of Satanism. I mean, it, I don't know if they are. Who cares? That has nothing to do with the actual vaccine mandate itself. It's necessary. Uh, people in the military, they take like how many vaccines? So what's one other that's going to save their lives potentially? But this is misinformation. But the worst thing that he said there was a lie about the safetiness of these vaccines. And Max Kennedy said it best. Notice the specific anti-vax lie at the end. Tucker Carlson claims the Biden administration has data showing the number of people who, quote, died from taking the COVID vaccine is actually in the thousands. This is why we can't get the pandemic under control. And that's exactly right. He is very deliberately trying to get people to think that these vaccines are dangerous and they might kill them. Now, I don't know what figure he's referring to that the Biden administration supposedly put out, but if I had to guess, it would be a figure on the CDC's website. Now, if you go to the CDC's website, they have a page where they talk about how the vaccines are indeed safe and effective, but they do list all of the serious adverse side effects. Even if they're rare, they do state some of the more serious 
adverse side effects that some people have gotten. And I think that this is where he's getting that number from. And once I read to you what it says, if this is indeed what he's referring to, you can see how he's misconstruing it. So it reads, reports of death after COVID-19 vaccination are rare. More than 386 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines were administered in the United States from December 14th, 2020 through September 20th, 2021. During this time, VAERS received 7,899 reports of death. That's 0.0020% among people who received a COVID-19 vaccine. That's the number that I think he's referring to, but uh, I'll continue reading. FDA requires healthcare providers to report any death after COVID-19 vaccination to VAERS, even if it's unclear whether the vaccine was the cause. Reports of adverse effects, this is key, to VAERS following vaccination, including deaths, do not necessarily mean that a vaccine caused a health problem. A review of available clinical information, including death certificates, autopsy, and medical records, has not established a causal link to COVID-19 vaccines. However, recent reports indicate that a plausible causal relationship between the J&J vaccine and TTS, a rare and serious adverse event, blood clots with low platelets, which has caused deaths. So if there's going to be any risk that can lead to deaths, they're going to state it right here. But I think that that's what Tucker Carlson is probably referring to. That 7,899 reported deaths. But it very clearly says on this document that I'm assuming he's referring to, uh, it says that there's no causal relationship. Correlation does not equal causation. So the fact that he would just put that out there into the universe and make his viewers think that thousands of people are dying from the COVID-19 vaccines, it's extremely irresponsible. But even if we accept his argument, let's at face value take that misinformation and let's assume that 10,000 people died from the vaccines and let's actually assume that it was directly related, right? They took the vaccines and they died. Let's assume that that is true. For a moment, it's not true. The vaccines are safe and effective, but let's assume for purposes of this argument that it's true. Well, compare that 10,000 deaths to over 650,000 deaths from the virus. It's still knowing that risk, which doesn't exist, it's hypothetical, but knowing that risk, it still makes more sense for people statistically to get the vaccine. He knows what he's doing. He's not, he's not dumb. This is a very, very smart and strategic propagandist. He knows exactly what he's doing. Even if the data that he's misconstruing meant what he thought it meant or wanted you to think it meant, it still wouldn't prove his argument. It's still better to get the vaccine. You're still better off to get the vaccine. It might save your life. Studies have shown that it's, that it saved hundreds of thousands of lives. The COVID vaccines have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. But Tucker Carlson, he's on a mission to uh, stop people from doing what's in their best interest, even if it's his own viewers. And it's not just Tucker Carlson, to be fair. It's all of Fox News' hosts. It's anyone online who's spreading misinformation. All of this disinformation has deadly consequences. Deadly consequences. And the problem is that there's just no accountability. He can spread this deadly disinformation and not have to face any repercussions. So I know that I'm a little bit late to the party on this, but I, I couldn't not talk about this. So I want to discuss the new ad put out by Marjorie Green, where she shoots a car that says socialism on it with a gun. Now, I get why people are kind of taken aback by this, because it's kind of a tacit endorsement of violence. But this whole meme of Republicans pretending to be tough and shooting things that they don't like in their political ads, it's not new. Like, the trope has existed for quite some time. I can recall politicians back in the 2010s, you know, they'd print up the entire thousand plus Affordable Care Act legislation and then shoot it with a gun. And they'd say, that's what we're going to do to Obamacare. And it's just extremely cringeworthy. And this is what Marjorie Taylor Greene did when she was running for Congress. She literally wrote socialism on a sign and she shot it. I mean, it's an embarrassing way to virtue signal, but they continue to do it. And they think that it's a good idea, but a lot of people are talking about it. And so I want to join this conversation because I have quite a bit to say about this. So uh, nevertheless, take it away, Marjorie. Joe Biden abandoned Americans in Afghanistan, got 13 of our best soldiers killed, 
gave a kill list of Americans to the Taliban and armed an Islamic terrorist nation with $83 billion in weapons like this one. Biden should be impeached. Now I'm doing a gun giveaway of my own, but for Americans only. I want you to win this 50 caliber rifle that Democrats will ban if they keep the House next year. While Joe Biden broke America's pledge to never leave a man behind, Nancy Pelosi is sneaking the Green New Deal into the $3.5 trillion budget. And in 2022, I'm going to blow away the Democrat socialist agenda. Go to the website below and sign up to win my 50 caliber gun before Joe Biden bans it. Well, I for one uh, believe that socialism has been thoroughly destroyed because she shot a car that had socialism printed on it. This woman is mentally ill. I just, I, I feel like even though it's Marjorie Greene and she's incredibly idiotic, there's got to be something deep inside of her that maybe just leads to her question for a second. Should I be doing this as a grown adult? Is this a little bit childish? Is this a little bit cringeworthy? But there, there's no, there's nothing, right? That mechanism, that self-awareness thing that's inside of us that gets us to think twice about embarrassing things that we do she doesn't have that. It's lacking in her. Like, what do you think that's going to accomplish? You're a politician. So is shooting a car that looks like a perfectly good car, is that really the best way to, like, promote your message? I, I just, if it's that easy, then um, I'm going to try it. Give me a second. Okay. See this? Capitalism. It's not in focus, but it says capitalism. I just destroyed capitalism. It's that easy. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I'm joking, like I feel like a douchebag doing that because it's so fucking stupid. It's so cringeworthy. And at the rate that she's going, like with how absurd her ads are becoming, I wouldn't be surprised if this was the next ad that she put out. Save America, stop socialism. I don't know what I liked more about that. Um, if I liked when she was like, <laughs> in its face <laughs> or the fart like th that's where we're at right if a republican unironically released that as an ad i would be like yeah i'm not shocked honestly that's the level of discourse that we're dealing with with the modern republican party they're that fucking stupid they're that galaxy brained it's just it, it's so embarrassing and, and this violent imagery that they always depict in their ads they're the first to blame violent video games and clutch their pearls about naughty words and profanity and if you disrespect god and their religion but yet they act so tough it's like they want to have it both ways it's this contradiction right they want to present themselves as these like badass tough you know uh, take no malarkey kinds of people but these are really the biggest snowflakes on the planet so uh, I don't even know what to say. Um, I just wanted to talk about this ad because I wanted some excuse to shoehorn in that TikTok video of the girl farting on the uh, the punching bag thing. I'll be honest, that's 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 my intent here. Um, I, I would like honestly, unironically though, if the Republican Party wanted to kind of workshop some ads with me, I think we can make it a lot more ridiculous than her shooting that car that says socialism on it. There's so much things that you can do. So much things you can do, right? I mean, I have all the ideas swirling around in my head right now. Um, but look, I, I just I look forward to what she comes up with next. She shot a sign that says socialism. She shot a car that said socialism. So 
the only other thing that I could think of that would like outdo those other ads is if she like spray painted socialism on a building uh, on a building and then like demolished it. But I don't know. Marjorie Green is a fucking moron and this is this is exactly what you'd expect from her. That's the level of substance that you should expect from dumb fucks like her. As you may know, a couple of weeks ago, the pandemic-related unemployment insurance had run out. And you may be thinking, isn't that a little bit strange to have pandemic-related unemployment benefits expire right in the middle of a pandemic? And yeah, that's logical. I get it. But we were told that it was really good that this extra $300 per week would be going away because currently there's a job shortage and nobody wants to work because they're getting so much money on unemployment. But in actuality, this trope that welfare makes people lazy is actually wrong, and it was disproven by data. So, in theory, you would think that the states that ended their pandemic unemployment benefits early would see a boost in job growth, right? Yeah, you would, you would think that if that were actually true, but the hypothesis was debunked by this headline. Axios reports states that ended COVID unemployment benefits see no boost in job growth. I'm going to read that again. States that ended COVID unemployment benefits see no boost in job growth. Wait, so you're telling me that having a social safety net doesn't actually lead to people being lazier? and that the job shortage doesn't necessarily have a direct connection to the $300 unemployment benefits that people were receiving as a result of the pandemic? Hmm. Interesting. So Axios explains, states that ended federal unemployment benefits earlier this summer saw August job growth at less than half the rate of states that retained the benefits according to new data released Friday by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Leaders in the largely Republican-led states had insisted that the benefits were discouraging people from work and ended the assistance program early ahead of its planned expiration on September 6th. The benefits, which came in the form of weekly $300 payments, had been in place since spring last year to help families through the pandemic. A growing group of states began ending the benefits Benefits in June in what they called an effort to incentivize people to return to the workplace. But here's what they're saying. Economists analyzing the unemployment issue have seen little evidence yet that cutting off the benefits has provided a clear boost to local labor markets in part because of difficulty separating the influence of the payments from larger shifts in the labor force or of the potentially offsetting damage done by the pandemic, Reuters writes. So, I mean, if you ask me, it might be a pretty good idea to reinstate those weekly benefits because all you're doing is you're making people less off, giving them less of a cushion that they desperately need during a pandemic that is still very much going on. It's not solving the job shortage. It's just not. People relied on that and it was really cruel to take it away from them in hopes that you would help big businesses. Now, in terms of why there's a labor shortage, it's difficult to say, but there's a multitude of theories. Axios writer Hope King believes that there's a worker awakening that's happening in the country, which arguably contributed to a shift in power back to workers, as described by Felix Salmon. And I think that that definitely has something to do with it, but the answer is probably pretty complicated. And I think it's important that we try to be nuanced here when talking about this. And there was one article that I think did a pretty good job at that. It was written by Emily Stewart and Ronnie Mala of Vox. And they really get into why there is this labor shortage. And, and, you know, it kind of goes both ways. There's a labor shortage, but a lot of people who are seeking employment are still having a difficult time finding a good job. So they explain, for some of the jobs available, people don't have the right skills or at least the skills employers say they're looking for. Other jobs are undesirable. They offer bad pay or an unpredictable schedule or just don't feel worth it to unemployed workers, many of whom are rethinking their priorities. In some cases, there are a host of perfectly acceptable candidates and jobs out there, but for a multitude of reasons, they're just not being matched. There are also workers who are hesitant to go back. They're nervous about COVID-19 or they have care responsibilities or something else is holding them back. The result is a disconnected environment that doesn't add up, though it feels like it should. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says there are 8.4 million potential workers who are unemployed, but it also says there are a record 10.9 million jobs open. The rate at which unemployed people are getting jobs is lower than it was pre-pandemic, and it's taking longer to hire people. Meanwhile, job seekers say employers are unresponsive. So if we're being intellectually honest, 
then it's a range of issues here. This is a very complex issue, and there's no simple answer. But if I could reduce this down to one solution, primarily for employers, it would be for them to stop being blood-sucking leeches and actually treat workers like human beings, and then maybe they'd actually want to work for you. Now, again, it's an oversimplification, but when you consider the fact that a survey published on FlexJobs found that 46% of job seekers say they're only finding jobs that are low-paying, I mean, that says a lot. Nobody wants to work for a job where they're overworked and underpaid during a fucking pandemic. I mean, who wants to go and be a door greeter at Walmart where you have to enforce their mask policy and have Karen scream at you and cough in your faces? Like, this is a serious time. Like, like it or not, the pandemic is not over. So to expect people to lower their standards... It just, it doesn't make sense. So, I mean, I, I think that part of the problem, not all of, of the issue, like not the totality of the issue here, but part of the problem, a large part of the problem is that employers need to actually pay people good wages. And preferably the government, the Democratic Party would force them to do that by raising the minimum wage. But I mean, if they weren't so fucking shitty and authoritarian and actually were more flexible with workers' hours and gave them a consistent schedule and more options to work from home, maybe people would want to work for them. But to suggest that getting an extra $300 per week temporarily would prevent someone from taking a job that would benefit their lives in the long term, that's just unrealistic. It's, um, it's absurd. Of course, that $300 was great. People who were on it, they desperately needed that. They relied on that, right? But if somebody saw a job that would be better for themselves long term, they're not going to choose to not take that job because that extra $300 per week is so good. They know it's temporary. They know it's going to expire. So anyone who believed that this $300 per week extra was leading to this job shortage, I mean, at best, it's an oversimplification. At worst, you're probably really naive to think that because people are complicated. People are looking out for themselves and, you know, the, their best long-term financial interests of themselves and their family. So nobody wants to, like, go back to work if it's going to be for some shitty job where they're paid nothing and they have shitty hours, right? So, you know, I think that Democrats, knowing this data is out there now, they should reinstate that extra $300 per week. The Biden administration just kind of like let it expire and put their hands up. But that's stupid. The pandemic is still going on and we should really be paying people to stay home, right? It's not like that extra $300 was leading to people not wanting to work. But really, in truth, we should be paying people to stay home. We should be paying people to not work right now because the pandemic isn't going to go away if it continues to spread, if people are still forced to go into work. And this was the solution from the get-go. Pay people to stay home. That's how you flatten the curve. That's how we could, in theory, do it again. But when you live in a late-stage capitalist society, uh, you know, that's not even an option. It's not even something that people are considering. And that's, that's kind of ridiculous, is it not? The idea that people should stay home and be paid so that way they're encouraged to stay home is outrageous to people. It's leading to people, you know, attacking our social safety net, suggesting that, you know, these unemployment benefits that people are getting, you know, during the pandemic is a bad thing. If employers are seeing a labor shortage and they expect people to want to work for them in the middle of a pandemic, then they need to do more, right? Meet them halfway, maybe even. But that's not like the entire picture. Again, this is complicated, right? But what I know for sure is that to take away that extra $300 per week that people on unemployment were relying on, that's really cruel. And it's a failure of the Democratic Party and the Biden administration. This proved that the argument that was used as the rationale to get rid of those benefits, it was flawed. Shocker. So give people that extra money because regardless of what your opinion is on this, we should be paying everyone to stay home right now. It's a pandemic. Stay home. Save lives. We should be doing that. When it comes to climate change, President Joe Biden talks a big game, and that rhetorical difference between him and Donald Trump is actually really important. Having said that, though, at the end of the day, if your actions don't actually match the rhetoric that you're espousing, then it really doesn't matter. You're not really an ally. And I don't think that anyone who watches this channel thinks that Joe Biden is actually an ally when it comes to the fight against anthropogenic climate change. But still, you are the president. You made many promises to young people. And you're not following through on those campaign promises.
So as Walker Bragman of the Daily Poster explains, President Joe Biden has been touring climate ravaged areas of America, warning that climate change is a code red emergency for the planet. And yet his administration has continued to boost fossil fuel projects and is now preparing to vastly expand offshore drilling. The White House argues that a court order it opposes and is appealing requires federal officials to lease more than 78 million acres of the Gulf of Mexico for fossil fuel exploration. Environmental groups, however, assert that federal law gives the administration broad discretion over whether or not to hold such sales. In fact, Biden's officials have instead used that power to officially declare that the warnings in the recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report does not present sufficient cause to reevaluate the drilling plan. Wow. With the help of the nonprofit public interest organization Earth Justice, several environmental and Gulf groups have now launched a lawsuit against the administration to stop the Gulf lease sale. The complaint argues that the environmental analysis behind the lease sale is based on outdated and arbitrary science in violation of federal law. So I want to go back to that quote. The latest IPCC report on climate change, quote, does not present sufficient cause to reevaluate their drilling plan. In other words, they saw that same report that we all looked at, that we talked about on this program, and they thought, meh, we're still going to drill in the Gulf of Mexico. That's what we're going to pursue. It's just, it's callous, it's heartless, and it's, it's psychopathic at this point. It is borderline psychopathic. We've ran out of time when it comes to climate change. Now it's a matter of how bad are we as a species going to allow it to get? And it turns out there is no limit to how, you know, devastating these reports are. It can say that, you know, the world is going to end tomorrow if we don't change everything immediately. And they'd still continue to do the same fucking thing. Now, it's not like Joe Biden, to be fair, lied about this thing because when he became the president he signed an executive order pausing all new leases for drilling on public lands and even canceled the drilling lease for the gulf of mexico drilling permit that we are talking about right now the 78 million acres and to be fair his administration canceled drilling leases in multiple states which did actually prompt lawsuits by republicans but with these lawsuits that his administration is facing from Republicans, that's where the issue comes in. Because rather than fighting and holding strong, well, of course, in true Democratic Party fashion, they caved. So Bragman continues, in response to Biden's order, 13 Republican states, Alabama, Alaska, Arkansas, Louisiana, Georgia, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Texas, Utah, and West Virginia sued the administration to restart the leasing program in the Gulf of Mexico, Alaska, and western states. Wyoming also sued in a separate suit. The state attorneys general involved in the suit were all members of the fossil fuel-funded Republican Attorneys General Association. Alabama Attorney General Steve Marshall is the association's policy chairman. In June, a Trump-appointed federal judge in Louisiana, Terry Doty, granted the 13 states a nationwide preliminary injunction against Biden's moratorium, directing the leasing program be resumed. Doty ordered that the administration was specifically barred from implementing the pause with regards to the lease sales in the Gulf of Alaska. Millions and possibly billions of dollars are at stake, Doty wrote. Following the ruling, the Republican states involved in the lawsuit filed a motion to hold the Interior Department in contempt for refusing to allow the order. The motion sought to compel the department to hold the Gulf of Mexico lease sale. In response, the administration filed notice that it was appealing the judge's order as well as a defiant brief challenging the Republican state's motion on the grounds that the court order did not compel Interior to take the action specified by plaintiffs, let alone on urgent timelines specified in plaintiffs' contempt motion. Nevertheless, on September 1st, days after filing the brief, the White House posted a new record of decision online stating it would be moving forward with the Gulf of Mexico lease sale and saying that the IPCC report would not change its environmental views on the plan. So that's what happened. It's not like Joe Biden did a switcheroo, right? He ran on ending drilling on federal property. And then when he got into office, it was a change of story. Now, he did actually follow through in the beginning, but this inevitable legal battle against this new executive order, which he should have anticipated... Because, as I said, it's inevitable. He just chose not to fight. He chose to unilaterally disarm. And think about the justification that the judge used, the Trump-appointed judge used, to um, 
go through with this uh, this drilling. Millions and possibly billions of dollars are at stake. That's what they care about. It doesn't matter that millions and possibly billions of lives are at stake. Money's to be made here. Look, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but if we don't end capitalism, if we don't kill capitalism, cap capitalism is going to kill us. Global capitalism is going to kill the entire planet off. And I just, I can't see any way out of this crisis with the current economic system that we have in place, with the current incentives that currently exist. It's just unsustainable. But I mean, I, I'm obviously preaching to the choir, but it's just really frustrating because even the bare minimum that we'd expect from a democratic administration, we don't expect them to actually institute a Green New Deal, but to not allow drilling on federal lands, that's like the bare minimum, and he can't even fight to do the most minimal thing that would have the least amount of impact. Just no new drilling leases. It's depressing, honestly. Every single climate change story that I do, I get more and more doom and gloom. But it's not like we can turn away and bury our heads in the sand. This is our planet, and we have to fight. And in order to fight, we need to know what's going on, and we need to know who's fighting for us. And it's certainly not Joe Biden. Which is why I was very, very adamant about electing Bernie Sanders in 2020. Because when it comes to climate change, there's no co compromises. Incrementalism isn't going to save us. Incrementalism is going to kill us. And when it comes to the U.S. pledge to finance developing countries' transition to sustainable energy, Biden just announced that we'd be doubling our contribution. But still, even with that bump, this was likened to throwing droplets at a fire. It's just not enough. And that's exactly right. Whatever he does, even if it's a step in the right direction, it's woefully inadequate because this is a crisis. I mean, nobody's acting like this is the crisis that it is in actuality. No, nobody, no politician is treating this with the urgency that it needs. This is a hair on fire moment and everyone's just asleep at the wheel. And I mean, already we see the consequences of anthropogenic climate change, record-breaking heat waves, wildfires that are now an annual thing, and yet we're all still just allowing capitalism to reign supreme. And the best we get are these weak fighters and Democrats who they'll talk tough, but when push comes to shove, they always back down. And that's really sad. But People like Joe Biden, he's not going to have to bear the brunt of what climate change has to offer. Future generations will. And they're going to be absolutely furious at the catastrophe that we are handing off to them. And I don't blame them. On Monday, we talked about how Iraq War veteran Mike Preisner disrupted a George W. Bush event. And now, in the same week, it happened once again. Another veteran has disrupted a George W. Bush event. So Jeb Sprague on Twitter, who's the one who actually disrupted this event, says, here is video of me shutting down George W. Bush last night. The wars he started in the Middle East damaged the lives of so many. He wasted trillions of dollars for nothing. Meanwhile, he's made tens of millions of dollars in speaker fees since leaving office. Sick. And he's absolutely right about that. It's really morally detestable to know that so many people are wanting to actually hear what he has to say. He's making millions of dollars as an ex-president in speaking fees when really this individual should be ostracized from society, right? He should be afraid to show his face in public because he is indeed a mass murderer who has not been jailed for the crimes against humanity that he has committed. But without further ado, here's the video. This was fantastic. Uh, okay. Now th right sir, this is not the uh, time. This is not the time for that, sir. Yes. Uh, no. No, it is uh, disrespectful to the audience. Yeah. Yeah, no. There we go. Um, that's okay. Here's the thing in America. Uh, the good news is, in other countries, the guy would end up in jail for yelling at a president. Here he's allowed to express himself, and I want to apologize for uh, 
that was absolutely incredible. You can tell that he was actually rattled. Like, we couldn't see his face in the speech that was disrupted by Mike Preisner, but you can tell he was actually visibly shaken by that. And he should be. Again, every single Bush event or speech should be disrupted for the rest of his life. He is never going to see a day in jail because he's an ex-president, because we don't hold our public officials accountable when they commit crimes against humanity. So this is not enough in terms of accountability, obviously, but it's it's something, right? It at least gives us a little bit of satisfaction knowing that this mass murder is going to be at least somewhat inconvenienced. Now, I love how at the end he's like, oh, well, in other countries, you know, a guy would end up in jail for yelling at a president, but he's allowed to express himself. Oh, well, how merciful of you. How merciful of you. Hey, another question for you, George Bush. In other countries, do they actually jail mass murderers? Do they jail public officials when they commit mass murder? In many countries, no. So it seems like we have more in common with these countries than you would lead us to believe, right? And I love how the person who was hosting it said that this is really disrespectful to the audience. So, fuck them. If you actually want to hear what this mass murderer says, you should be disrespected in my opinion. I have no respect for you. You're not a good person if you want to hear what this war criminal has to say. I mean, are you going to show up to listen to other mass murderers? Do you want to hear what Ted Bundy has to say? These people, they don't comprehend the gruesome reality of George W. Bush's crimes. I don't even think he comprehends the gruesome things that he did. He didn't have to see firsthand the bloodshed that he caused. He sent other people to do his bloodthirsty bidding. And maybe that's how he sleeps at night, right? Because those images of death and torture and suffering, those aren't actually burned into his his mind like they are for Iraq War veterans like Mike Preisner. And I'm assuming uh, Jeb, who is uh, disrupting this event. But either way, again, I'll say it again. Anytime there's an opportunity for you to disrupt or protest at a George W. Bush speaking event, you should do that. Because if he's not going to go to prison, at a minimum, he should be embarrassed to show his face in public. He should expect large crowds of protests everywhere he goes for the rest of his life. He should expect people to barge into every single speech or interview that he gives and protest. Because this is a mass murderer, and we should treat him as we treat mass murderers with utter contempt and disgust. Conservative writer John Nolte penned an op-ed for Breitbart, and I don't really know how to even describe this other than to call it a banger, because this is the most absurd op-ed I have ever read, and I'm not being hyperbolic. Like, we're talking the dumbest thing ever written that was published in a major outlet. So I don't even really need to give you that much setup. I think you're going to see why on its face, this argument is insane. So he writes, in a country where elections are decided on razor thin margins, does it not benefit one side if their opponents simply drop dead? Starting off strong. Uh, if I wanted to use reverse psychology to convince people not to get a life-saving vaccination, I would do exactly what Howard Stern and the left are doing. I would bully and taunt and mock and ridicule you for for not getting vaccinated, knowing the human response would be, hey, fuck you, I'm never getting vaccinated. And why is that a perfectly human response? Because no one ever wants to feel like they are being bullied or ridiculed or mocked or pushed into doing anything. Who wants to cave to a piece of shit like Howard Stern or Jimmy Kimmel or these repulsive doctors for refusing to treat the unvaccinated or Bette Midler or, or, or who wants to feel like they're caving to a guy who's such a piece of shit he publicly mocks people who have died and he's not just a piece of shit for mocking them. He's a piece of shit hurting the families the dead men left behind. He's talking about anti-vax radio hosts that died from COVID-19. No one wants to cave to a piece of shit like that or a scumbag like Fauci or any of these scumbags at CNN LOL. So we don't. And what's the result? They're all vaccinated and we're not. And when you look at the numbers, the only numbers that matter, which is who's dying, it's overwhelmingly the unvaccinated who are dying and they have just manipulated millions of their political enemies into the unvaccinated camp. Wow. So in other words, 
because you're telling us to get vaccinated knowing how petulant we are, that's essentially reverse psychology. And really, to make us not be vaccine hesitant, Democrats should be telling us not to get vaccinated. I mean, is this not a tacit admission that your side is petulant and emotionally unstable and immature and just stupid overall? You're essentially arguing that my side is too stupid to look at the facts and we're going to make an emotional response and knowing how emotional we are, really leftists and liberals and public officials, local local governments, they should have kept that in mind and they should have told us to not get vaccinated because then we'd try to spite them and we would get vaccinated. I just, I, I don't really understand what your overall argument is. You're mad that Democrats and public officials are pushing the vaccines because your side is stupid. I mean, what do you want me to say to this? What do you want me to say to this? I'm sorry that your side is too petulant. I'm sorry that your side bases their entire political ideology on owning the libs and they won't even do something that's in their own best interest. But I don't know what the expectation is here. If you truly want your side to not be stupid, maybe write an article where rather than blaming the libs or public health officials, you blame your side for not doing more to promote vaccinations. Blame your side, Tucker Carlson, right-wing media outlets, for lying to people about how safe and effective these vaccines are. Why aren't you blaming Donald Trump for not promoting vaccines more stringently? I mean, when he tried to promote the vaccines, he got booed. His own supporters booed him for daring to tepidly endorse vaccines. So that says more about you and your crowd than it does about anyone else. It says that you're too emotionally immature to be grown-ups. And I I'm sorry, but you being man babies, that doesn't mean that we should like try to play 3D chess to get you to do what's in your best interest, which is obvious to most responsible adults. Should we baby Republicans more? Like, I, I just don't know what the implications of this article are. What does he want? What does he expect? I I what a fucking idiot. I mean, yes, I, I agree with the premise that Republicans are basically adult babies, but we shouldn't promote misinformation so that way they try to do the opposite of what we want them to do, we being responsible adults. They should just look at the real information, stop getting their news from Facebook and Fox News, and just do what common sense dictates they should do. But of course... They're not going to do that. And this dumb fuck is going to blame everyone else rather than them. And, you know, one thing that you might be wondering is, well, if it's really the case that public health officials and the Democratic Party just wants Trump supporters to die, wouldn't they not support vaccine mandates? And he has an answer for that. He says the push for mandates is another ploy to get us to dig in and not do what's best for ourselves because no one wants to feel like they're caving to a mandate. Okay, well then, I mean, I, I just, I don't know what to tell you. We try to tell you to take the vaccines. We then try to force you to take the vaccines and you don't like any of that. So, I mean, I, I, just, I don't know what you want. Yes, I, I agree with you. Your side is dumb, but there's not much more that we can do to help you out. Maybe you should be looking in the mirror. Maybe your party, maybe right-wingers should be a little bit introspective and try to figure out ways to stop being so reactionary and actually not be anti-science at every step of the way, in every aspect of life. He adds, I could be wrong. Maybe the left isn't that evil and sly. Even if this isn't the left's plan, who's owning who? I mean, the mere fact that during a pandemic, when you're having this serious conversation about vaccines and people who are dying, you're even talking about who is or isn't being owned, that alone shows how petulant and stupid your side is and i don't want to use too many ad hominems right but i mean it's true like you're you're literally admitting how stupid and petulant your side is i don't know what to say i don't know what to say if you acknowledge that there's a problem if you know that the vaccines are actually safe and effective and really it's the unvaccinated who are dying why would your first instinct be to blame the people who are promoting vaccines, shouldn't you target the individuals who are spreading the disinformation that's leading to deaths of your side?
Shouldn't you look at Tucker Carlson and Republican Party officials, anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers? I mean, they have no shame. Even when they happen to be right about vaccines, they still come up with some batshit justification for their side's overall stupidity. It's just, it's gross. Look, here's the thing. I know people who are vaccine hesitant, and even if I disagree with them, even if they're fucking insanely stubborn and they're insufferable, I don't want them to die. These are friends. These are family members. Believe it or not, not everyone is out to get you, right? Not everyone is trying to win one over on the other side or own the other side. Some of us just want you to take the vaccine because we don't want you to die. I mean, it's a big country. Odds are every single person watching this knows at least one person who's not vaccinated. So maybe it's the case that out of the goodness of our fucking hearts, we just want you to get vaccinated so you don't fucking die. But to him, to this dumb fuck, he sees this as some 3D move. So ultimately, we convince you to not get vaccinated by telling you to get vaccinated because we're trying to use reverse psychology on you. <sighs> yeah. It's just, um, I don't know what else to say about this. I, I think that on its face, this argument is absolutely irrational and absurd. He's not looking within. He's not looking to the failures of his party and his ideology and their anti-science, anti-intellectual behavior. He's still blaming Democrats and everyone else. Well, folks, we have a Herman Cain Award to give out today. For those of you unaware, Herman Cain Awards are given out to folks who are anti-vax, anti-mask, and ultimately end up getting sick or dying because they refused to take COVID-19 seriously and vaccinate themselves. And today we have a doozy. So this headline basically says it all. Anti-mask Florida GOP bookkeeper dies of COVID, leaving party without access to finance software. His death also opened up a firestorm of conspiracy theories from other local Republican Party officials. That headline is going to break my brain. But I mean, this is certainly deserving of a Herman Cain award. And the details of this story are just, it's not surprising at this point in the pandemic, but his death, the way that it affected other people in the party and their response, it truly is astonishing. Salon explains, after spending months railing against COVID-19 precautions and criticizing Dr. Anthony Fauci, a Republican Party official in Florida passed away this week, leaving his county-level GOP organization without access to critical financial accounts. Greg Prentice, 61, served as accountant for the Hillsborough County GOP and also chaired the organization's Committee for Election Integrity. A software engineer by trade, Tampa Bay's local patch outlet reported that he built and maintained the local Republican Party's campaign campaign finance software last year and was responsible for filing its monthly reports to the Federal Elections Commission. A FEC filing from the surviving members of the organization claims that Prentice died without sharing login information for these accounts or any sort of instructions for how to use them. The letter also tells the regulatory agency it will likely need more time to complete a report on its August fundraising numbers and foreshadows trouble compiling the local party's financials for future months as well. In addition to his role compiling the Hillsborough County GOP's financials, Prentice spent most of the past year fear-mongering about COVID-19 vaccines mask mandates, and other pandemic safety measures, like many other conservatives in public life. He took aim in particular at the White House COVID-19 advisor, Dr. Anthony Fauci, writing on Facebook that America needed to end Fauciism. He also argued that we need more socialist distancing than we do social distancing. Mm, it sounds like we actually need more social distancing after all. This is just a crazy crazy story this doesn't seem like a dumb person right this is an individual who designed this software and he may be a republican and i think that republicans and conservatives in general are inherently flawed in their thinking but this isn't like a dumb person this is someone who's relatively competent and yet he refused to get the vaccine and he died now herman cain awards tweets out not a fan of mask mandates, refuses to get vaccinated, wants to end Fauciism, catches COVID-19, lasts 24 hours. We honor former Florida GOP official Greg Prentice with the Herman Cain Award.
And that really is well earned. And I should add that the Herman Cain Awards, like I don't necessarily believe that the goal is to be callous. The goal is to point out how your actions have consequences. And if anything, the Herman Cain Awards should serve as a reminder to people how effective the vaccines are. It's not people who are vaccinated who are taking up the ICUs in hospitals across the country. It's unvaccinated people who usually post COVID-19 misinformation, anti-vax misinformation on their Facebook accounts. I've browsed the Herman Cain Awards subreddit, which uh, I've been told is the idiot cousin to the Darren Awards. And some of the memes that are shared by people who won Herman Cain Awards and want to die, I've seen these memes shared by my IRL friends. I've seen them post it to Facebook, former coworkers, friends. And it's just a matter of time before, you know, I see someone get a Herman Cain Award who I know in real life. I mean, we're all at some point at the rate we're going, going to know someone who wins a Herman Cain Award. And I want to prevent that. Nobody wants to give out Herman Cain Awards. But I think it's necessary to raise awareness about how people not getting vaccinated they're playing with fire. They're rolling the dice with their own lives. Now, the circumstances surrounding his death are even more bizarre because there was a bunch of conspiracy theories and um, accusations against the hospital that he was at by his Republican colleagues. And this is truly weird. Prentice's death has also opened up a firestorm of conspiracy theories from other local Republican Party officials, including one who called COVID-19 a medically engineered virus and suggested without evidence that his death was the result of wrongdoing on behalf of the hospital he was being treated at. Jason Kimball, a fellow Hillsborough County GOP member and close friend of Prentice, even suggested that Tampa General Hospital was performing intubations illegally, Patch reported. Kimball, whose LinkedIn profile says he is a pharmacy technician at a local Walmart, called the procedure a high fatality protocol in comments to the Tampa City Council. ER and ICU doctors are criminals and murderers, Kimball wrote on Facebook. They intubate everyone and stick them on a ventilator for no reason, just out of precaution, as the doctor told me, without consent from the family. Tampa General Hospital is evil. At least one council member interrupted his comments to denounce the conspiracies. Well, there's that. At least one person denounced the conspiracy theories. What do you want the doctors to do? If these people don't have oxygen, they're going to get intubated. It's not like these doctors and hospitals are sitting there, you know, uh, laughing, going, Whoa, as they intubate more and more people. They're just following procedure. There's not much you can do for someone when they get to that point. And their initial instinct isn't to reflect on their stance towards this pandemic. Their instinct is to attribute blame to the hospital, to doctors, the people who tried to help him, rather than thinking, oh, well, you know, maybe this should be a wake-up call and maybe I should get vaccinated. No, they think, oh, these doctors killed him. It's just they're always moving the goalpost and it doesn't really matter how many wake-up calls and how many Herman Cain awards are awarded to people. There's still, like, once your mind is set, it's going to take a lot to actually convince you. It has to come from someone who they trust and I just usually, you know, your social circle is all going to have the same opinion on this. So, I mean, I don't know what to say. The best that we can hope for is we share stories like this and we share the Herman Cain Awards with people whenever somebody wins it in hopes that maybe we'll begin to get through to people. But at this point, I mean, time may be running out. I don't know what to say. I don't want people to die, especially if their death is preventable. Even if they're Republicans and I disagree with them, that doesn't mean that I think that they should be killed right or, or or die i want them to be saved perhaps later we can rehabilitate them and they can move away from their conservative views but i'm not cold i don't want them to die but i mean i have to be honest my sympathy for these people is running out because at this point in time with all of the available data we have if you don't get the vaccine i mean i don't know what you expect you're, you're just stupid at this point you're stubborn and your stubbornness is going to lead to you dying so I just, I don't know what else to say. Stop being fucking stupid. Get the vaccine. It's what's best for you. You're not getting the vaccine because I want you to, to appease me. Get the vaccine for yourself. You're not owning the libs by not getting the vaccine. You're only fucking yourself over. And I'll leave that there. 
Well, that's all that I have for you. Thank you all so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far in the program, as usual, before we leave, I want to take some time to spend a, uh, send a special uh, thank you to all of the people who make the show possible, all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members who help us not just to survive, but thrive as well. Uh, if you want to support the show, I would encourage you to uh, look at our Patreon and YouTube membership options. Uh, but I think that that's all that I have on my heart. So I will see you all next week. I believe Twitch live streams will resume next week perhaps the week after but um yeah folks uh, as always you can see me here every single day on youtube so uh, i'll see you all next week my name is mike figueredo this has been the humanist report take care